Okay, let's try that again. Now it's okay? Yep, thank you. Uh, okay, great. Thanks so much. Uh, thanks for coming out on a Saturday or staying in, I guess, right? We're all at home. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, building ethical software under capitalism. So, all right. So that's me on Twitter. I'm also on Mastodon if you want to follow me over there. I'm on the Fossidon instance. Uh, and I work at the Software Freedom Conservancy, which is itself a nonprofit organization. And I'm going to talk a lot about nonprofit organizations um, in this talk, along with a few other alternative structures for building software and um, some ways that we could reform the, the other structures that we use to build software. So nonprofits. Um, <laughs> They're great. Uh, I've worked at nonprofits for most of my adult life, and uh, there's a lot of things that nonprofits can do. Uh, you can set them up for just about any kind of thing, like arts or uh, uh, advocacy or creating something for the public good. Um, and you know, that's it's like a specific legal structure because uh, most most things that we do end up under a for-profit structure. And so if you're going to be nonprofit and work in the public good, you have to specifically say so. So um, I went to public school, which in the US is the cheap one. It's the one you hear about where teachers have to buy their own pencils and chalk and paper and stuff for the kids. Um, the schools in the US are pretty underfunded. So we do a lot of bake sales. We do candy sales. We sell really ugly wrapping paper, everything. If you're a kid that goes to public school, they are constantly asking you to sell stuff to raise money or to collect stuff that can be either sold or uh, turned in for money. So like kids would um, collect paper to recycle or collect books to do a big book sale. There's all these different things. So kids like who go to public school, like you get pressured to learn how to fundraise pretty early on. Um, I was always pretty good at it. I guess I liked the competitive aspect and it seemed like it was a nice thing to do. So um, when I got to high school, I joined the marching band uh, and because it's not a sport, uh, the marching band is also a place where you have to do a lot of fundraising. Um, it turns out that actually people really like the idea of children with trumpets and instruments. It sounds like really wholesome and you know, team building and all this kind of stuff. Um, despite the fact that like a very tiny percentage of children end up actually being professional musicians. So in the marching band, we sold more candy, we sold uh, pizzas, we sold sandwiches, like uh, all kinds of different, um, you know, kind of promotional stuff for the marching band, like big mugs that said like, I'm a marching band mom and things like that. So. Um, so we did, you know, so I've known that fundraising, like getting people to buy something they kind of don't really want, but for something that they think is nice is, uh, is a thing that you do if you want to do something that doesn't just automatically get funding. So, uh, so raising money for charities is this, it's this huge, it's like a whole industry. You can get newsletters about it. The, uh, there are people who work as consultants to help you at your nonprofit organization figure out how to improve your fundraising. Of course, you have to have some funding to hire such a person. There are seminars, um, people you can follow on social media. So like it is its own whole industry. Um, but I want to break it down for you, like how fundraising for nonprofits works so that you can understand what kinds of things get funded, who funds what, and why we have things that we might want to do in free software, particularly, that are hard to get funding for. So uh, grants, wealthy people, and non-wealthy people, those are sort of the three main categories of places where you get money from nonprofits. Uh, so grants are great, but they involve a lot of paperwork. This is um, from the movie Brazil. Um, and uh, so you do all these different, uh, you fill out like a lengthy application. Um, sometimes you fill out a lengthy pre-application before you fill out the real application just to let them know that you're planning to fill out the long application. So grants are a lot of work, but they can be a good amount of money. Um, compared to the amount of work. So the work to money ratio for uh, getting stuff for your nonprofit entity, your, you know, your pet project, um, 
it's good if you ha are doing something that is something that grant makers want to fund. And we'll talk a little more about that, but like the things that grant makers want to fund are um, not so abstract. They like to see numbers. They like to see uh, deliverables and uh, tangible proof that you're making the world a better place which is a lot more difficult if what you're trying to do is create free software so that we don't end up with a terrible dystopic like surveillance nightmare state. So like when you ask, you know, like if you wanted to make a graph and be like, here are all the times that we failed to create a surveillance dystopia night nightmare state, they'd be like, I, I don't, where did you get those numbers? So so grants, it's it's hard to find grants for free software, like when unless you can tie it to other stuff. Um, wealthy people like to give money. This is a meme from uh, Jeff Bezos gave money to something, and uh, the the joke is that the amount that he gave was such a teeny tiny drop in the bucket, and he really likes to give an amount that sounds huge to people that don't have money, but it's like the wealthiest man on earth. So. Um, if he wanted to fund real systemic change, he could start by paying his workers, um, but he could also give a much larger amount. Um, and that's just Jeff Bezos. Like, a lot of wealthy people do like to give money, and they mean well, and it's nice, but they definitely want a little kind of ego stroking in exchange. And so uh, raising money from, like, wealthy individuals is its own whole kind of, like, you know, uh, artwork, or I guess, art form. And so uh, they want you to remember things like, you know, what their kid is into and when their birthday is sometimes. Like some, there are lots of folks that just are like, here's the check, don't talk to me on next year, do whatever you need to do. But there are, there are also lots where it's like, oh, you know, like I want a weird thing or I want you to promise not to have soda at your events because I feel like sugar is the devil or I want you to like, you know, use this terminology or ostentatiously thank me in public. So, like, it's uh, the motive isn't a hundred percent pure. There's always there's a little aspect of like, can you make sure people know that I'm awesome? Uh, not always, but often that comes with a large wealthy donor. Um, so, some with less paperwork and a lot less money are individual, like regular individuals, not people that just write like a. $25,000 check without thinking about it, but people who are like, oh, I support this cause and I like to give like 20 or $50 for things that I support, uh, which is great. And, um, but it's, it's almost like you still have to enter it as paperwork if you're raising money for a nonprofit and you still have to like track that gift and make sure that it, you know, didn't come from um, somewhere illegal. And um, so if you're trying to raise money for something that poor people understand, so like if you want to raise money for like, you know, kids with trumpets, um, parents of children with trumpets, especially in like nice suburbs, totally understand They will buy your chalky, nasty candy and your ugly wrapping paper and all this type of stuff. But if you want to create real change where you are making lives better for people who are poor, you have to go talk to people often you have to go talk to people who know poor people, and um, and they are. And the thing that's interesting is that they're very willing to give. They completely understand the problem. But if you want to raise a lot of money from poor people, then you have to talk to a lot of poor people, and that's a lot of work. It takes a really long time. Plus, it's a it's really uncertain uh, because when the economy goes bad. Um, People like Jeff Bezos apparently thrive, but people who were already like kind of a little underemployed or had like a are supporting a, a family member that is keeping them from working full time, those are the people who are hit hardest when the economy is bad. So when there's the most need, the people who are the most willing to give are the first ones to run out of money. So that means that you know this all goes to shape the type of things that get funded in general. So who does get funding? Um, so it's really hard to get people to give to radical stuff. Like if you if you have something like a, a really bold, like maybe people think it's a little wacky idea, um, it's really hard to get funding for that. If you want to do more of the same thing that produces the kinds of nice graphs that people who make grants and 
uh, and other larger corporate donors like to give to, then it's a little bit easier. But if you want to do something like way out there, um, it's really hard to, uh, to raise money for that type of thing. And free software's coming in, but it is definitely like still perceived as sort of a weird idea that not just like, you know, Linux on a server, but like that um, giving individual users control over their computing experience still kind of sounds like, well, why? Um, and so, you know, obviously we're continuing to work on that and I think we're making progress, but uh, we're not getting like half a million or $2 million checks for it yet. Um, so folks just, they just don't give money and resources to the people who actually need it. Um, so uh, many years ago, I worked with a woman. It was like a crummy summer job. And we were, uh, <laughs> incidentally, we were fundraising. And she said that she had been homeless last year. And that when she would ask for change on the street, um, people would give her money if she looked clean and happy, but if she looked like sad and depressed and kind of hadn't been able to take a shower for a couple of days, like no one wanted to look at her or even give her money. And this is unfortunately sort of like a, a, a microcosm of what happens on the macro level. There are lots and lots of causes that are not cute children with trumpets that are not like, oh, look, we're helping kittens and, and animals or we're, uh, look at these fat cheeked babies. We're helping like, you know, childhood uh, nutrition and stuff like that. There are lots of people that need help that are, they're a little rough around the edges. They're, they've been living on the streets or they have problems with mental illness or uh, they have physical disabilities and they've been underserved for a long time and some of them are really cranky about it and they completely should be cranky about that. And when you ask for money for a pile of kind of like cranky people that, you know, don't clean up nice for little pictures in your grant, it's harder to raise money. So there's this like whole thing where, uh, you know, the less you look like you need money, the easier it is to get. Uh, so how do we fix that or how do we game that or how do we work with that information to do what we want to do? In nonprofits, the way that folks do this is they um, raise money along affinity lines. So uh, if you, like, I live in Massachusetts in the U.S., and there are a lot of women's organizations. So I've been to a lot of fundraisers for women who have, like, okay jobs um, to raise money for causes or clinics or resources for women that don't have a lot of money. And, and I feel like, oh, yeah, you know, like, and, and I know they're doing it. It's fine. And the same thing happens with uh, queer organizations. So if you were lucky and you uh, your parents were accepting and you have a nice job now, like maybe in tech, and you're queer, uh, there are queer organizations that are like, hey, why don't you give money and help us serve, like, trans homeless youth? Because... Um, Maybe you feel some affinity along the, the queerness that you share, um, and they could really use your help. And you seem to be doing okay, so maybe you could write a check. So this affinity line is really key. And people do it along all different things. Like people do it with their religious affiliations, um, you know, race lines, local affiliations, all of these different things that prompt people to give money, uh, people who do have money, to give money to folks who, you know, remind them of themselves a little bit. Uh, but, you know, the people who need money can get it. And so it's, the affinity line is really, uh, is important for fundraising. So what do we do in free software? Like, I mean, software is like, okay, like, so, and we do have some good, like, um, successful nonprofit and, you know, like at the Conservancy, we has the outreach program. And so when you say like, hey, remember when you were starting the code and it was kind of hard to do, like fund newcomers to free software doing an internship that's paid. And so outreach is one of the more successful uh, programs because like, again, like there's this affinity line that is uh, happening in the fundraising. Uh, so, um, and we do, we have a lot of fantastic nonprofits. Like obviously I, you know, the Software Freedom Conservancy isn't the only one. The GNOME Foundation is fantastic. Python Software Foundation, uh, SPI, like, yeah, I could do slides and slides and slides of nonprofits in our space. Um, 
and and that is a great place for us to build software because by building software under a nonprofit umbrella you're saying that you're only going to build software in the public good and that means that you can't like block out uh, competitors by being like kind of like you know uh making it hard for them to access like improvements and changes because it's all open um it also means that you can't do things that exploit people if you're doing it, if you're supposed to be building software for the public good so you know the the point of your software can't be to like trick people into clicking on a link that you know hacks their computer so you can't do that under a non uh, like a nonprofit umbrella so um and how do these organizations get funded? A lot of tech jobs pay really well, and people who work in tech understand what tech needs, and they understand uh, that some of these projects really do need to be vendor neutral, like Git, um, or, uh, or like a programming language like Python. It really needs to be vendor neutral so that, you know, you can use it again and again and not have each and every single company like reinvent version control, reinvent like all of the Python libraries. Like that would just be ridiculous. And so developers understand that and they're willing to pay and help organizations that want to make that happen. So, um, some, so now we're going to talk about the capitalism part. Um, if you're only listening, this is a big brown object that says capitalism on it. Um, and capitalism kind of ruins everything. So um, when we think about like which kinds of software projects get a lot of money and which kinds of projects get don't get as much money, uh, all of a sudden the capitalism like brings it into like sharp, clear relief. So if you work at a large company and you say, hey, you know, we should really fund some software, the ROI or return on investment is key to whether the people who run this, like a publicly traded company, are going to be interested in funding the software you're developing. So if you say, hey, our company makes a ton of money off of this cloud server technology and they are out with the cup again and want you to donate, then it makes a lot of sense. You're like, well, we we put into the um, you know community managed or the in common software like the you know the platform because we make money off of that platform being well used, well tested, and robust. So now, if you say, oh, like here's this other software that doesn't make us a ton of money, but is a really good thing to do and seems really useful, you're not going to get as warm of an answer, and you're definitely not going to get a half a million dollar check. So, uh, so software that actually serves marginalized people is not as lucrative, and it's like this chicken egg thing. They're marginalized because they don't have a lot of money, and they don't have a lot of money because they're marginalized. So, like software that serves people that don't have a lot of money means that you're not going to get them to give you a lot of money for the software. Um, so again, it's like how capitalism works. Like the more money you have, the easier it is to get more money. And the less money you have, the harder it is to keep hold of anything that you do have. So uh, some of the things that I think we could really be, you know, would be important to build in free software are software like this, like circumventing firewalls, safeguarding whistleblowers, uh, software for visually impaired folks, anti-tracking tools, police recording apps, social media that users can control their experience on so they don't get harassed all the time. Um, and don't have to like constantly put up with yammering from Nazis. Uh, media servers that don't censor queer material. So all of these things are things that I think as a society are really important for us to build and they should be secure and they should be well maintained and they should be accessible and they should be easy to use and they should be well documented. All of which takes resources, right? Um, but if you go and just say to like a large company like, hey, do you want to like fund all of this stuff? And they're like, well, who's going to pay for firewalls circumventing software? And it's like, well, they're not really going to pay for it, but they really need it, you know. Or who wants to pay for media servers that don't censor queer material? And it's like, mm, I don't know. Um, so the the only exception to this is if you uh, are building software where the person using it is the product. And then, you know, and so, like, this is one of the, the places where poor people get, like, all the software they want, whether they want it or not. 
So like there's uh, already like surveillance cameras in public housing. Um, you know, if you use Facebook or uh, any of the other like kind of mainstream social media, like they follow you around and they look at the ads. Um, even like, you know, when you're searching for stuff like, or you're looking for, you're looking something up on your phone. Like maybe you, you looked up something about, um, you know, lamps or whatever. You were like, oh, what are those lamps called with the eco-friendly light bulbs? I forget. You look it up and then the next time you go on any kind of like social media or like look something up through like a big corporate search engine, you have a million lamp ads. They want to sell you all the lamps. So like being able to sell data about you and what you're interested in and what you're likely to purchase is the one way that uh, underprivileged and uh, marginalized folks get lots of software directed at them. And I don't mean for them, I really do mean directed at them. So uh, so how can we fix that? Like, can we, is there a way to make helping people a business model? Um, you go in and talk to like most companies and you're like, hey, I, th I think we should just like help people because it's the right thing to do. And they're gonna be like, that sounds about as useful as putting pants on a rat. Um, and so you, you'd have to figure out how to game it if you want to get uh, money and resources and time and energy from like a for-profit entity to be sent, you know, to be spent on actually helping people. So uh, one one thing that uh, companies really like to do is to let the world know that they're they're okay with gay employees because um, apparently there's like a, a lot of uh, folks that like a lot of companies could use more employees and they would like to let you know that you can totally apply and work here even if you're gay even. If yeah, and so so they like to invest in things like like corporate stickers or like rainbow socks or that type of thing. Um, but rainbow capitalism, like if you're not doing the work, it's not it's not real. So like here is a number of different logos from different companies that wanted uh, people to know that like they shouldn't boycott them if they're gay or they shouldn't not apply to work here if they're gay, but. This includes companies like Twitter that doesn't make sure that trans activists are safe, that doesn't make sure that black queer activists are safe. So this is, it's a lie. Like, they just want you to know that uh, that they're, you know, they will accept your uh, information and put it into their algorithm. They will continue to use you as a market um and that it's okay if you also want to come here and work making the thing to exploit other people, like even if you're gay. Which is like, who cares? Like, keep your socks and your stickers and your rainbow washing uh, logo. So rainbow capitalism is still capitalism. And that's not to say that, like, if your company is really doing the work, that's great. Like, it's, uh, but if you're, if you're just providing the t-shirts and you still aren't um, providing resources for people in your company who identify as some type of queer to move up the ranks and move into a leadership position and you aren't allowing the decision making processes at your company to make sure that queer people feel safe on your website, then uh, then it's just junk. It's just for show. Um, and it's the same thing with uh, open source exploitation. Like if you're um, Palantir or you're another company building software that spies on people that helps ICE do its job that helps put children in cages but the source code is available that's not like you're not doing it's not it doesn't like wash out like there's not like a certain amount of um you know like stuff you can put back in the main like the upstream that makes it okay to help put children in cages there's no like you know, trade-off there. So uh, I read this recently, and I totally recommend it. It was the Fake Nerd Boys of Silicon Valley, and it was about this whole thing on how, like, a lot of the CEOs of large tech companies um, are super into, like, uh, like a lot of the nerd stories, like Star Trek or Lord of the Rings and... Um, you know, and Star Wars and all these different things. And it, it's just, it's really interesting because they want all the trappings of these things. So it's like you, the, in the um, piece she talks about like, you know, like a CEO, like buying a really expensive custom made lightsaber um, or um, 
you know, building like a replica hobbit house and stuff like this, but like not really understanding that they're not the good person in the story. Like they're Saruman, they're the evil spying on you all the time. I, um, so there's a real lack of awareness that and I think it's it serves them. It's like, oh, if you just like fill up your office with like nerd fun stuff, like it you don't actually have to do the work and understand the moral and political implications of your software. And that's a lie. Um, so you know, all the trappings and none of the morality. Um, of course, there's Spock uh, visits Hobbitland fanfic, uh, if, if that's your jam. Um, I was looking for a good picture for the slide, so you're welcome. Um, so open source exploitation is still just exploitation. So if you're building software that exploits people, but the source code is available, you don't get a free pass, even if you have a ton of super awesome Star Trek stuff in your office. So. Um, so can we fix things from the inside? Like sometimes, you know, there's the what a software is eating the world. Um, and it, it feels like this huge engine of things that is really hard to change. So let's talk about the specific levers that folks are working on to affect change from the inside. And then we'll talk about some from the outside. So uh, encouraging self-reporting is a really big one. So there's, you know, uh, when... Um, we we're starting to look at the numbers of uh, women and, you know, women, men, and people of other genders that were working at different software companies, not including the janitorial and building staff. Um, some companies started record, were like reporting their numbers, and then it made other companies feel like they ought to also like report their numbers, uh, and that can be really powerful. So, for instance, like this place, um, this is a. Uh, milk and it says no artificial growth hormones on it so uh i live in new england and we have a lot of cows um so we produce a lot of milk and cheese and uh probably like and this is probably like 20 years ago a few of the independent dairy farmers started writing no artificial growth hormones are, are in this milk or were used to get to this cheese or this yogurt or whatever and the big corporate like dairy companies were like Hey, hey, you can't just say that. And they're like, we can, because there it isn't in there. And they're like, but we can't say that. And it's like, you know, so like Garlic Farms and Stonyfield Farms are like, we know. That's why we put it on our milk, to let people know that it's not in here. And they're like, we are implying that it's bad. And it's like, isn't it? Um, and in fact, they charged a little bit extra for milk that wasn't produced with bovine growth hormones. For folks that do not know, because a lot of, uh, there's been, I, it might even be called something different somewhere else. A lot of the factory farming in the U.S., like big, um, you know, large agricultural factories, uh, use bovine growth hormones, and it kind of like it's sort of like steroids for cows, but it doesn't. It makes the cows less healthy and more prone to infection. And so, uh, by saying like, "Oh, we are not doing that," uh, they were able to. They started self-reporting, and then people started looking for milk that said it didn't use bovine growth hormones. Um, so the self-reporting thing is something that tech companies could do. Like maybe they would say, "Like, hey, we don't um, we don't work with ICE," or uh, you know, "We don't track you," or um, "We're uh, we're not like." putting all of our servers into a landfill at the end of the year, every year we're trying to recycle them. So there's like all of these different ways that companies that are doing some things correct could self-report and then hopefully encourage other companies to also sort of do that thing. Um, so it almost it makes like ethics a, a market niche, which um, which could be great. Like, you know, as we, as we noted before, there's this like huge uh, talent shortage where uh, people want to, you know, people want to work somewhere good that uh, isn't evil, I think, mostly, um, although it probably pays better. Um, but like, there are lots of folks that are looking for a job that is ethical. And so, uh, so you could work on getting your company to do some things that are ethical and then use it as a market niche if you want. Um, so and and there are companies that are starting to do this this is an article just from earlier this year like january and it was a bunch of it was a number of different ethical tech companies i mean ethical it's 
your ethics, my ethics, all the different ethics, there's, um, we probably disagree. A lot of, you can see here, there's pictures of trees. So you, uh, you can guess that most of the ethics that they were pushing are environmental, which is, is great. There are lots of other ways that tech can be ethical or not ethical. Um, so uh, if environmental is the most important one to you, then working at a company that is interested in having it be part of their brand, that they are environmentally ethical, um, then this would be a good place for you to look. Um, and it might encourage other companies to be like, how come they want to work over there and not for us? And it's like, well, because, you know, they're being listed as environmentally ethical. So uh, another thing that we could do to work on things from the outside, I mean, from the inside is to write letters or organize strikes or walkouts. Um, and this has happened, a lot of like Google employees have done this a couple different times to protest the treatment of harassers. Um, uh, but there's been a number of other uh, movements in this area. So like depending on what it is that is going on at your company, you could organize a, a walkout or a strike. I recommend writing a letter first and then doing the lockout. Uh, and you're going to need allies. You're going to uh, be able. You're going to need to get organized. Like these are things that you. These are like collective actions. Um, one person writing a letter not as strong as like one person writing a letter that 200 people have signed on to. One person doing a walkout just looks like a really long break. So, you know, when you do walkouts and strikes, it has to be like a, a big organized collective action. So I don't want to minimize the fact that that is a lot of work and a lot of organization to do, but I think it's worth doing if you don't plan to leave this company that's doing something that you find unethical, then the next best thing would be to try and get it to fix itself. So, um, and there are folks doing this, like, so there's a number of different chapters and um, it, it, like individual like organizations under the loose banner of like, we won't build it or tech won't build it. So if you're, if you're you, maybe you got an awesome new job in the last two months and you need to pay off like a ton of debt so you're not going anywhere but you found out that they're doing something like providing some awful uh insidious surveillance software or something like that so then this would be the option for um uh you know approaching the like hey let's not build stuff for ice let's not um like build more surveillance software let's not build uh, software that makes women vulnerable to former angry partners, uh, things like that. So, like, if you don't want to build it, then there's a, there may be a group already in your area called We Won't Build It. So, uh, so that's something you could look into. Uh, and then uh, the Tech Workers Coalition is uh, is another place, and they have a lot of different chapters and people that are interested in doing those things in other places. So, like I said, you're going to need a network for this kind of action. Um, and uh, and this may this may be the best place for you to get started, depending on what you want to do. So, what about not fixing it from the inside, but creating our own alternatives? Um, Oops, I guess I have two of those. Uh, so uh, community-driven nonprofits. I talked about the Software Freedom Conservancy, um, but GNOME and Python and some of the others that are in our space are uh, a way to build software without it being specifically beholden to a financial return above all other considerations. So nonprofits, like I said, must be doing their work in the public good. So you cannot do like nasty things. You can't do, you can't cut ethical corners, um, even if it's really lucrative, if you're building nonprofit software. Or at least that's the way it's supposed to work. I'm sure there are people who figure out how to like work around those rules. Um, they're not at the conservancy, so. And I don't think they're at GNOME either. So that's like, so if you have a software project, you could bring it to an existing umbrella organization and make sure that it is beholden to those kinds of uh, nonprofit ideals or whatever the um, equivalent is in Europe or, or where you live. Uh, worker controlled options are another thing. So like if you, if you don't see like a nonprofit organization you want to join or you want to like have a little bit more flexibility in your corporate structure than a nonprofit organization provides. Um, so a worker controlled option is another thing. You could start a cooperative and make rules for yourself that you're going to be more ethical than just sort of a anything for money. Like capitalism will let you just kind of, 
you know, if it if it turned out to be financially profitable to drown puppies, you'd have to make a really good case about why that's a bad idea at a for-profit company that is legally beholden to shareholders to do anything that makes them more money. Um, so current you can bind future you and your software to ethical choices. So your cooperative could decide, like, we're only going to work with nonprofit organizations or we're only going to work with labor unions. Um, that's like our market niche. That's our reason for being. And we're not going to take other clients. So you could decide to just find a niche of where you build software for a cause or um, you know, for something that you think is important. Maybe you decide like, oh, we're going to like help uh, victims of domestic violence. And so we're going to like, you know, maybe we're going to build burner phones for women and, uh, and other folks who have been victims of domestic violence. So you might decide like your, you know, your company's whole reason for being is a niche that is ethical. Um, so if, and you put it in your bylaws and then you can't, undo it later so later someone's like oh like can you help me with this like pollution scheme or whatever and you're like oh yeah sorry we only work with labor unions so we can't really help you like hide pollution because it's out of our charter um some if you if you work this correctly you can get certified as a b corporation and this is in any com in any country like you have to fill out a bunch of paperwork and then you get certified as a social benefit company some of the more uh, more famous ones are like Patagonia or Ben and Jerry's. Um, so they're classified as a social benefit corporation. So they make money, but they also uh, have agreed to only uh, be good in the way that they have described. And so, like you'll see, like different like ethical hiring practices or um, environmental practices or, or different types of things like that, like where when they are faced with a decision like oh this would make more money but be unethical but and this would make a little less money but be more ethical they don't have to constantly be like well it could be super bad pr so maybe we should do the right thing anyway if you're classified as a social benefit corporation you already have like the internal rules and scaffolding to let you make the correct decision um so we could build that that could be amazing like um it's, it would be more work. It's definitely a little bit more work. Like just showing up and working at a large company and hoping to get bought and then living off the payout for like a couple of months, it's a little easier than building your own thing from scratch. It's probably also a little bit more lucrative to take money from unethical actors because like, unfortunately in the whole like capitalist backdrop that we live in, um, it's often really profitable to be completely unethical. Um, when you look at the way that uh, things work environmentally, like there's, this is a huge example, like um, clean up after yourself or leave a bunch of pollution in the river for somebody else to pay to deal with. It's obviously cheaper to just leave it for someone else to deal with. Um, but if you don't want to be like doing the equivalent of that, then um, it is a little more work, just like it is a little more work to clean up after yourself. So uh, a couple other things like policy changes, like what if we sort of change the rules a little bit that affect the production of software? Um, you know, so we could treat some um, some of the software tools that people use as if like they're a public utility. So maybe search engines would be that way or um, media hosting or uh, social media. Uh, things like that, like, or, and especially like the way that ISPs interact with people. I know that's more of a problem in the U.S. where we get like kind of the capped uh, network speeds. But um, if we subjected uh, some of the things that uh, we do online and use online to some of the same kinds of regulation that we do other utilities like electricity and water, like tap water is supposed to be reasonably clean and um, electricity that comes into your house isn't supposed to burn your uh, plugs and destroy all your machines. So um, they're regulated. We could regulate the other tools that we use. Um, we could require an ethics audit or ethics reporting. Like uh, factories have to do reports on like their emissions into the air and the water. Uh, we could require that companies do an ethics report on the way that they handle people's information and make sure that they are being responsible with it and that 
people are reasonably aware uh, and have a reasonable amount of control over the way that their information is handled within their company. Um, there are some existing ethics boards. A lot of them tend to be around the AI work uh, because, you know, like, I guess everyone's seen movies where like the computer intelligence turns evil and like eats people, Terminator, you know? And so, uh, so companies are like already, a lot of them have their own ethics board, but then when you look at who's on those ethics boards, you're like, I'm not sure any of those folks are uh, qualified to say anything about ethics. Um, and so, so taking these existing ethics boards and then making them subject to some public scrutiny and some amount of accountability is another policy lever that we might use to control the way that AI is used and put some more safeguards on there that are people focused as opposed to just I think the internal ones tend to be really focused on like make sure that we don't have a PR nightmare like we don't want to be today's like Orwellian story in the newspaper so um, if we push those ethics boards to be more accountable to the human beings that they're making software for instead of their bottom line that's another policy lever we might use um, and we could look at other legislation um, like you know, me like giving people more power over like medical devices um, and uh, and devices that are in their home, like requiring them to be more secure and requiring them to uh, be able to look at the source code for uh, sensitive devices. Um, you know, this is a picture of Roman Supreme who's wearing a rubber boot on his head. And if he can get involved in politics, anyone can, right? So why not us? Like I. Um, Whenever I do call an elected official, and even where I live in Massachusetts, which is home to MIT, and talk to them about a tech issue, they seem really surprised. So you could be like the only person that they hear a reasonable free software perspective on if you call your elected officials. And that is super important. If you got one other person to do it, they'd be like, whoa, apparently everyone is worried about this. So that would be amazing. So wrapping up. And then I'll take questions. I'm really interested to hear what y'all have to say or add and stuff. So uh, make change where you are. If you work somewhere that uh, could use some improvement in its ethics and treatment of its users, um, see if you can find some friends to make some change where you are. Um, or if you are in a position where you're able to start your own project, like make it a collective or part of a nonprofit, or uh, see if you can get it certified as a social benefit corporation. So that you, like, current you can bind future you into um, making the software that you're building only be used for good. Um, and then uh, work on changing the rules. And this is a like highly location specific on what's up for debate and what is in the realm of possibility with the politicians that you have. But if you pay attention and make like two calls a year, like, you know, that's great. I hope that everyone listening to this talk is able to do that. Um, so if we're the ones building the world, do folks know this is a Harold in the Purple Crayon? He, he builds his entire, he, he makes his own world. Um, and we all do too. If we're building this software and we're allowing folks to use it um, and we're choosing where to work and who to work with, like we are making that world. There's no like they are making us do this. Like we have, uh, we have power. They can't build it without us. So um, let's use that power. Uh, so have picture credits. Um, and I would be willing to take some questions. I'll go see what folks have in the chat. Or if um, it's OK with me if people want to turn on. I don't know if we have that set up. Thank you. Very great talk. Uh, so do you have Etherpad open? As there are a few questions there. Yeah, I do. I do. Yeah, uh, so you will read it yourself, or do you want to read it for you? Uh, let me see. Uh, oh, OK. Um, Oh yeah, okay. So how do you see a charter, a license, and a code of conduct different, differently influencing company and project decisions around ethics? Um, that's a great question. Um, so uh, I'm gonna start from the end. The code of conduct influences the way that, or can if it's properly implemented and isn't something lazy like be excellent to each other. But if it's 
a, a good code of conduct with some teeth and some, um, you know, measures for what happens when people don't uh, adhere to it, then that seem, that that's like uh, directly kind of pointing at the way that companies treat their employees and the people that they work with. Um, a license um, is for the software, and that I think. Um, the way that I think about it, it, it's mostly to look at how you would um, treat the users of your software so that they have control over the device or the software that you've given to them. Um, charter is like if you mean like a like a like bylaws for a company and like how like what the company or project's mission is. Like if you put that in, then it means like when you uh when you want to do something counter that charter you have to have a discussion you can't just like kind of quietly um you can't just kind of quietly decide to do something that you think other folks in that are involved in your company and uh your your board or whatever your governing body is would be opposed to um let's see so we were having a discussion in the chat. Is there a difference between a strike and a walkout? So a strike, I think, is just intended to be like a strike is like we won't come back in the building until you fix this. A walkout is we're leaving for an hour or two hours or whatever so that you know we're serious. And then we're going to come back in and give you a chance to do something better. So a strike is probably after a walkout doesn't work. Um, as far as carrot and stick, um, you know, the carrot is good until you hit the place where it's not, and then you need the stick. Um, so I would try the carrot first and then the stick later. Um, and then, so, oh, so, and then this one's interesting. Since not-for-profit is, is far from perfect placeholder for ethical companies, do you have any advice on how to look deeper into where one works and puts their money and energy? So I would look at the uh, mission of the nonprofit organization that you're looking at. And I would also uh, like kind of look at the charter, who's on the board, if they have board minutes. Um, for uh, nonprofits in the US, they also file something called a 990, which uh, like, so when I think of nonprofit, it's interesting because there's a lot of different sizes of nonprofits. Like I was invited to a fundraising event where, you know, like learn to fundraise and it was me uh, from an organization that had like two other employees and someone from MIT and MIT was there like oh one of our best fundraising hacks other was to get people to give on the Fibonacci sequence so they're like 20 and 25 year alums are paying like fifty thousand dollars a year and I'm like oh I'm just trying to get our ten dollar people to give 20 bucks um, so you can look at the number of people that give money like an average donation. That's one way to kind of gauge the kind of support that a not-for-profit has. Um, and then also you might look at like what someone gets paid. If you think that it's not part of like, if, if you think it doesn't socially benefit the world to have someone who makes like almost a half a million dollars a year to kind of sit in an office and hang out and feel like they're doing something nice for some companies, then that might not be the kind of not-for-profit organization that you're interested in being involved with. Um, so yeah, uh, why ethics than morals? I think it's just the, probably just the language that I'm used to. And to, uh, to me, like, uh, moral sense specific um, and maybe more personal, whereas uh, I think ethics, it's, to me, it just sounds like trying to get at something there's more agreement around. Um, but I, I, I can, I'll be in the chat for a while. We can talk more about that. And then um, the last one I see is uh, I've run into a maintainer whose software gets used by many, many commercial companies with weird requirements, and he demands money to review their patches. Fair. Uh, but when you send him a patch as a non-affiliated volunteer, he refuses to review unless you get him funded. Also fair. Uh, but that makes it basically impossible for the community to contribute what to do. Is that person the only maintainer for the project? Someone else asked. Um, yeah, that's interesting. Like, I mean, if, it, if that's a free software project and you have like one person that's not interested in, you know, running it as a free software project, I mean, this is a little different than the kind of ethics that we were talking about, but um, I think, um, yeah, if that person is the only person doing that in a software that you want to use to um, 
you know, like you want to use in other situations, it, it might be time to fork. I don't know. Um, so I don't know if there was anything. Oh, yeah, I see a little bit of chat about governance is a key ingredient on the ethical stuff. Yeah, I mean, governance is is definitely uh, important. You want to make sure that um, that's why it's really important when you start a new project. Like if you if you do get inspired to go and start like a nonprofit entity or, or like a project that you tend to bring you tend to bring to a nonprofit or a B corporation, it's really important to get agreement on what is ethically important to you with your co-founders. Um, so the people that you choose to work with, like if they disagree with you ethically, you're um, gonna argue about it eventually. Is that the, I hear a foof noise, does that mean we're out of time? Yeah, we are just uh, uh, right on time. That's okay. great. And uh, yeah, uh, there are no more questions, uh, but like and everyone is free to continue discussion in the chat or in the Etherpad section. Uh, thank you very much. Thanks so much. It was great to see you all. <laughs>